Okay, Happy New Year. I think I can say that, right? Like, we had a little debate in our house, like, can you say it on New Year's Eve when it's not yet the New Year, but it's so far the New Year, the next time we see each other will be like seven days into the New Year. Do you still say Happy New Year then? Well, anyway, Happy New Year. And we uh, trust that God will continue to lead you in this new year. Today I want to share a message with you that's kind of the first of a two mini-series sermon series that we have today and next week called Upwards and Onwards. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10 or look it up on your phone. Hebrews is in the New Testament, close to the end of the New Testament. And if you will turn with me there to chapter 10. So it's December 31st, New Year's Eve, and I thought, what better day than today to be looking back over the year and to really focus our attention upward as we reflect on how God has been working in our lives over this past year. What was 2023 like for you and your family? Was it a good year? Were there challenges? When I was preparing for this message, I was reviewing some of my old sermons on this particular passage in Hebrews that I'll be sharing about today. And I saw that I preached on the same text here in Hebrews 10, here at Grace, in August of 2014. That's just about 10 years ago. And the thing that really caught my attention is that as I was reviewing that message, in the introduction to that message back then, I was commenting on the troubling reports that we were hearing about on the evening news. You know What were the highlights in the news 10 years ago? War erupting in Gaza between Israel and the Palestinians and the breakout of the deadly Ebola virus. Can you believe that? Here we are at the end of 2023, almost 10 years later, has anything really changed? Wars are still raging. And viruses are still creating havoc in our world. And as we even witnessed this Christmas, COVID and nasty flus were hitting so many of our families here at Grace. And all this unrest and chaos often creates some anxiety in us, some worry. And it can create a lot of uncertainty about the future. But isn't that just part of life? Life will always have its uncertainties, won't it? And as I was thinking about this, I listed a number of uncertainties that I have experienced in the course of my own life. I think I've shared with you that when I was 13, my parents separated. And as a young preteen, I felt like my life was really falling apart. When I graduated from university, I was still a single guy, but I really did want to get married. And then I got my first job as an engineer, but the job involved a lot of travel. And so the thought of settling down and getting married just seemed so out of reach for me. A number of years later, in 2001, my doctor informed me that I had a kidney, a tumor on my kidney about the size of a baseball And suddenly I was facing a health crisis. And then in 2003, I felt God calling me to leave my engineering career and to pursue full-time ministry. But the financial impact of that decision and what it would have on our family actually created a lot of unrest and concern in my heart. You see, life will always have its challenges where the outcomes are unclear. Maybe you're facing your own uncertainties. You don't have a job and you're wondering how you're going to pay the bills next month. Or you're facing your own health issues. So many people in our church family are facing health issues right now. Or maybe your marriage is going through a difficult time and you're just struggling to figure out how to fix it. Now, I don't know about you, but when life gets stressful because of uncertainties, I just want to go back to a time when life was easier. 
A, a time when there were fewer problems to worry about, when, when the future seemed more clear and less cluttered. And I think that for many of us, when we face challenges in life, we long to go back to better days, don't we? To the way things used to be. Is that true for you? That was the case for a group of Jewish Christians that the author of this letter in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, was writing to. You see, these Jewish Christians were being persecuted because they had recently become followers of Jesus. And you see, the issue was that the traditional Jews in the community were treating them harshly because they felt that these new Christians were abandoning the traditional Jewish religious and ceremonial way of life. And these persecuted believers were facing their own uncertainties about the future. And it led them to be discouraged and and even disillusioned about the way life was going. They were ready to give up. And they just wanted to go back to the good old days. Back to their old way of living when things were easier. But the author of Hebrews writes this letter to them and he says, don't do it. Don't give up on your new life in Jesus. Life as a follower of Jesus is so much better than that old way of life. Don't abandon your faith. Don't give up on this new hope that you have in Jesus. And then he does what all good leaders do when people they are leading face difficulties and challenges. He encourages them to press on. You see, when things are rough, we often need encouragement. Is that true for you? When the road ahead gets rough, we need something to restore our confidence, to give us a new sense of hope, to help us feel like we're not alone. And so today, as we think about this past year and the uncertainties that we still live in, I want to encourage us through the message from this passage in the book of Hebrews. Let's read together Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 35. Verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus... By a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, here in the book of Hebrews, the author wants to encourage us as believers. And he begins by reminding us that During times of uncertainty, we need to be looking upward. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near to God. Remember the author of Hebrews, he's writing to these Christian Jews who were struggling through difficult times. Now later in the chapter, we read that these believers had gone through so many hardships, like they faced public insults and humiliation. They were imprisoned for their faith in Jesus. They had their property taken away from them. And some of their fellow believers had even been killed for their faith. They faced extreme hardship because of their faith in Jesus. But now this persecution was beginning to scare them. And many of them thought that if they just went back to their old way of life, if they just went back to that traditional way of living like a Jew, making sacrifices at the temple, following the Mosaic law, these Jewish traditionalists would just leave them alone and life would get back to normal again. 
They were ready to just give up on their faith for the sake of avoiding difficult times. Now, I have to say, I wonder how I would react in a situation like that. I mean, I used to get nervous just being around people that weren't Christians. I can't imagine what it's like to face people who may want to harm you because of your faith or even kill you because of your faith in Jesus. But isn't that really just human nature, our our survival instinct, if you will? When we face hard times, when things aren't going well, we just want our troubles to go away. We wish we could just go back to a time when life was good, when things were going smoothly, when there was more fun and less stress. But is that the reality of the world that we live in? Friends, we all know that hard times will come. And as believers, this is even more true for us. Jesus himself warned his followers. He said, in this world you will have trouble. And here in this passage we read, the the author of Hebrews has just finished writing about this incredible truth that because Jesus died on the cross, these, these Jewish Christians didn't need to perform all of these religious sacrifices or ceremonial practices anymore. And so he encourages these believers to respond to that incredible truth. And how does he encourage them? Well, the first thing he does is he invites them to draw near to God. And that's the first thing I want us to remember today, is that in times of uncertainty, when we feel like giving up, God wants us to turn our focus upward and draw near to him. Do you feel near to God? I think feeling near to God can be a different experience for different people. For some, it may be when they're reading the scriptures or reading the Bible and they're really sensing the Holy Spirit speaking to them directly through a particular passage or some of the verses that they're reading. For others, it may be that they're alone in a time of deep prayer, lifting up Not just their burdens, but also their joys and celebrations to the Lord and and experiencing his presence and peace in those times of prayer. For still others, it may be just walking down a quiet path in the woods, enjoying the beauty of God's incredible creation, feeling his presence there in the wonder and in the quietness of nature. But drawing near to God takes intentionality you see it requires a daily awareness of how much we need him it requires developing habits in our lives that make time with God a priority sometimes though I feel inadequate to come into the presence of God maybe that's true for you as well Sometimes I feel like I've messed up or I've I've allowed distractions to take over my thoughts or my actions and I get to the end of my day and I realize that I haven't really thought about God very much at all. Maybe you felt that way. Maybe you feel like you're just not good enough to come close to God. But you see, here in our text, the author of Hebrews encourages his readers that God wants us to come to him. And the author says we we can draw near to God, our Heavenly Father. And what does he base that encouragement? Well, he says we can have confidence to draw near to God because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Look at verse 19 and 20. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus... By a new and living way opened for us through this curtain that is his body. The passage says that we have confidence to enter into the presence of God. That term there, the most holy place in that verse, is a reference to the Jewish temple. Where there was a special room there set aside for God's very presence to rest with his people. Originally, only the priest was ever allowed to go into that room, and then only once a year when he brought a blood sacrifice in to cover over the sins of the people. But now the author of Hebrews says, 
Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. And he paid the price for all of sin once and for all. And so everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus can now come into the presence of God with confidence. See, verse 20 tells us he, Jesus, provided a new and living way for us to draw near to God. We don't need to draw near to God through a priest anymore. We don't need to offer sacrifices to pay for sin anymore because Jesus has paid for our sin. We have a a living way to draw near to God, and it's through Jesus who died and rose again from the dead. And that's the second thing I want us to remember today is that we can draw near to God with confidence because Jesus made the way possible through his sacrifice on the cross. Because of Jesus, we can come confidently, or as some translations say, we can come boldly, and we can come personally into the very presence of the living God anytime, anywhere. And that should give you incredible comfort when you're facing times of uncertainty in your life. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 139. I love it because it reminds me that no matter what, because I'm a child of God, there's no place, no circumstance, no person that can get in the way of me experiencing the presence of God in my life. Listen to these encouraging words. Verse 7, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go to the heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. What an incredible psalm. God invites you to come to him to draw near to him with all your needs. And here in our passage, the author says that we can draw near to God with confidence. But there are a few factors connected with this drawing near to God that we read about in our text, things that we are responsible for. You see, in every relationship, there's two sides, right? And our relationship with God is no different. Look again at verse 22. Let us draw near to God, the author says, but how are we to draw near to God? Well, the author gives us several characteristics. First, we are to draw near to God with a sincere heart. As you read through the Bible, you'll quickly see that in Jewish culture, the heart represented the inner part of a person. Our modern culture recognizes this in some way. A lot of love songs speak about the heart as the source of our love and emotion. But in the Bible, the heart represented much more than that. It represented emotion, yes, but it also represented intellect and a person's will. In a sense, we can say that a heart represented the being of a person. And the state of one's heart determined their behavior outwardly. Jesus taught us this in the Sermon on the Mount in the beginning of the Gospels in Matthew. He taught us that God is not just looking for us to obey his words with outward actions like the religious leaders of his time were doing. No, he wants to know that when we say that our lives align with him and his word, that it's coming from our heart our whole person. Jesus is telling us that our surrender to God and our obedience to live the way he wants us to live is motivated by a real change that takes place inside of us. That's the sincere heart that God is looking for when we draw near to him. We come into his presence with a true Genuine desire to be in a close relationship with him. Not only when we face the challenges of life so that we can then experience his incredible love and peace and strength, but but also when we experience joy and things that are going well for us so that we can express our gratitude to him and praise him for his goodness, as we just sang about. God wants us to draw near to him. 
Just as a father longs to have his child crawl up on his lap, to kiss the little owie on his finger, or to snuggle up with him with an exciting storybook. We draw near to God with a sincere heart. The second characteristic when we draw near to God is that we do so in verse 22 with full assurance that faith brings. That phrase literally means with openness, with outspokenness. We could say that we draw near to God with conviction, with with complete certainty. What does faith mean to you? When our culture talks about faith, I think it often is referring to this blind acting on some whim. There's no real confidence, but rather a wishful, let's try this and see what happens. It's not the kind of faith that the Bible talks about. Faith is a solid trust that we place in the one and only living God who has shown himself faithful in keeping his promises. We, we talked about that in our arrival series at Christmas. He has shown himself powerful in his creation and in the everyday miracles we see around us. And he has shown himself gracious in being patient with us when we mess up, offering his forgiveness when we're willing to admit when we've messed up? Do you have that kind of confidence, that full assurance that faith brings when you come into the presence of God? As followers of Jesus, we can come into God's presence boldly because our faith in Jesus gives us that assurance that our sin and our brokenness has been paid for on the cross. That's what the author of Hebrews reminds us of earlier in his letter in chapter 4. He says, let us approach the throne of God. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What a great promise. The third characteristic in our passage for drawing near to God uses Old Testament language to describe the ceremonial cleansing that Jewish people were required to do before they could enter the temple or before they could participate in religious activities. Look again at verse 22. Let us draw near to God, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, his sacrifice paid for all of our sin and brokenness. The Bible says that That sacrifice essentially washed us clean, to use that imagery. You see, sin is described as a selfish independence that we have that that pulls us away from God and lures us to live life on our own terms. Sin is rebellion against God. And, And that sin, though, was paid for by Jesus on the cross, And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus and you surrender your life to him, your sins are washed away, the Bible says, and your relationship with God is restored again. That's the cleansing that happens. It's the internal cleansing that takes place in our heart, that cleansing that relieves us from the guilt of the sin that we commit. Jesus' sacrifice provided the way for us to be washed clean to remove the guilt that weighs so heavy on our conscience when we live against the way that God wants us to live. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never experienced the cleansing that Jesus offers you. The remedy is simple. Believe that Jesus died for your sin and your brokenness. Ask him to forgive you and then surrender the control of your life to him then you too can draw near to God with a heart cleansed from a guilty conscience. But you see, that cleansing is not just a one-time event that happens when we give our life to Jesus. That cleansing must be a daily practice where we confess our sin before God every day so that there's nothing that can hinder us when we come to draw near to him. In 1 John John writes, 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. As we close out 2023, do you want to draw closer to God? We can often get so caught up in the busyness of life. We can get so overwhelmed by the burdens and cares, trying to solve the problems of life on our own. But God wants us to take our eyes off of ourselves and to turn them upward to draw near to him. And then when we do finally refocus our attention upward, the author of Hebrews tells us something else to encourage us. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. We talk about hope. We talked about hope in our Christmas series, didn't we? When our future is uncertain, it's so easy to lose hope. Dr. Kent Hughes says this, hopelessness is the lot of the honest secularist. He talks about a survey done by a professor at New York University who asked 3,000 people this question, what do you have to live for? 94% of his respondents said that they were simply enduring the present while they waited for the future. They waited for something to happen. They waited for the next year. They waited for a better time. They waited for someone to die. They just waited for tomorrow to come. Dr. Hughes goes on to say, so many people live on so little, surviving in this world, just putting one foot in front of the other as they depend on unsubstantiated, ungrounded hope. But that's not the hope that is offered to followers of Jesus. Our hope has some real teeth to it. And this again comes from the author of Hebrews in chapter 6. He writes, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. And that's the third thing I want us to remember today. Our hope as Christians is grounded in the life, the death, the resurrection, and the reign of Jesus. The Bible calls that hope an anchor. When the storms of life are howling around us, when the waves of trouble and crisis and health issues and financial instability and broken relationships, when this chaos is all raging around us in life, we have a hope, and that hope is in Jesus. He anchors us. And as Dr. Hughes says, it's not anchoring us into the bottom of a dark sea. It anchors our soul in heaven. Our hope anchors us in the truth that God is faithful. And he will protect us. And he will provide for us. And he keeps us secure until that day when we will literally draw near to him as we stand in his presence for eternity. That's the real hope we need to hold on to. And how are we to hold on to this hope? Look again at our text. Unswervingly, the author says. That word literally means will not bend. You see, when the stress and the pressures of life are pressing on us, we will not bend because our hope is in Jesus and it's firm and we know that he who promised is faithful. As 2023 comes to an end, let me encourage you today. Whatever uncertainties you may still be facing, whatever storms you are going through, whatever health issues or financial burdens or relationship challenges, turn your eyes upward. Draw near to God in confidence, in faith, 
and with unwavering hope because in Jesus we have an anchor that will hold us safe and secure and we serve a faithful God who keeps his promises. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you remind us in your word that you are a faithful God and that you keep your promises. You keep your promises that we can cast all our cares on you and you're with us, that you'll never leave us or forsake us, that in you we find strength in times of trouble. Thank you, God, that we can draw near to you and that we can draw near to you because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins so that we, God, we can be restored in a relationship with you. I pray if there's anyone here who has never surrendered their life, God, that today would be the day that they can draw near to you because they put their faith and trust in Jesus. And God, for those of us that struggle for those of us that perhaps are carrying heavy burdens, God, may we take our eyes off ourselves and look to you as the one to give us strength and wisdom and direction to see us through the challenges of life. Thank you for the freedom and privilege it is to draw near to you. May we do that again in this new year. Thank you for your faithfulness in this past year, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.